All right, well, welcome to the second edition of the Ring Speaker Series this fall. We're going to do something a little bit different. I was at a research conference at UNC Chapel Hill a while ago, and they had graduate students introduce their speakers. And I thought, well, that's a good idea we've never thought of. Uh, so Emmy's actually going to do the presentation. But I will say, uh, this is Brad Case. I knew Brad before he was Dr. Case. I knew him when he was a PhD student at Yale, so, um, uh, uh, which, which means I've known him quite some time. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Brad. But Emmy, you're going to do the introduction. Oh, and drinks, thank you. Off the, for, while the pictures are being taken, drinks and containers off the desk, please. Hello, everyone. So I want to introduce our distinguished ring speaker for today. We have Dr. Brad Case, CFA and CAIA, also his PhD. Uh, he is the chief economist at Middleburg Communities, which is a fully vertically integrated um, rental housing provider that develops, owns, and manages communities across the Southeast. He has 30 plus years of research in residential and non-residential real estate markets getting his degrees from Williams College and University of California at Berkeley, as well as getting his PhD from Yale University, where he's worked alongside uh, Nobel Prize econo economist Robert Schiller. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Brad Case. Um, what I want to do today is talk about how real estate, um, how real estate is done at Middleburg Communities, which is the company that I work for. So let me, uh, let me start just by talking about my company, Middleburg Communities. As Emmy was saying, we're vert fully vertically integrated. What that means is we've got a team who does nothing but look for pieces of land. Um, then and once they have identified a piece of land, we've got people who underwrite, you know, are we likely to be able to do a deal on that land? If so, we go through the process of getting the the entitlements and, um, and actually buying the land. Once we have bought the piece of land, it gets turned over to our development team. They figure out what we're gonna build on that piece of land. Um, we, we, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we build, but typically um, it'll be a piece of land that'll support a community of, I don't know, six buildings and a total of, I don't know, 250 or something like that, um, apartment unit, rental housing units. Um, and so the development team will get it, will take that project all the way until we're ready to start construction. Then we have our own construction company, um, you know, uh, uh, general contractors, uh, you know, licensed or whatever in the eight states in which we operate. So they take over the property f uh, through construction. Once we are, once the construction is done and done enough so that we're ready to start renting the places, then it turn gets turned over to our asset management team which oversees the actual you know, rent uh, people on site and, um, and just takes care of the, the management of that asset and also the reporting to our investors. We have a separate team that does, uh, that does the, uh, you know, raises capital for each of our projects or, for, or sets up uh, programmatic joint ventures that fund any, any uh, development of a particular type. So we do every step of the, of the process. Um, we try not to work with brokers. We sometimes do, but we try not to. We try to have it all in-house. Um, and, <clears throat> and sometimes we will buy a property, and sometimes we will sell a property. And in, because of that, in some cases, we end up um, managing a property that's owned by somebody else. But we never go out and try to get a management, management contract. We basically just manage our own properties. Um, and so we focus on the eight states, basically from Virginia down to Texas, um, Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, Tennessee, Alabama. We actually don't have anything going on in Texas at the moment. Um, so, so it's really kind of seven states at the moment. And we also own almost nothing right now because back in 2020 and early 2021, it was a terrific time to sell property. And we sold everything we owned except for one property in Atlanta. And we tried to sell that one and the deal fell through. Um, so we now own that property plus another one that we bought near Orlando. I think those may be the only two actual operating companies that we own right now. There may be more, I, 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 don't, I actually don't keep tabs on that sort of thing. Um, but so, but, so that's, that's sort of the general idea of this company. We're based outside of Washington DC in Tyson's Corner, which is great. I have an 11 minute commute. It's the shortest commute I've ever had in my life. It's so awesome. And we, we have a few other offices. Um, interestingly, we were talking about this at lunch. We work from the office. 
with very few exceptions, we don't work from home. And the reason for that is so much of the productivity of an office comes, with, comes in the unscheduled conversations that you have with other people. No agenda, you're just passing in the hall and you trade some ideas and that ends up, and you have no idea at the time that that's gonna end up being useful. And it does end up being useful. It also gives you an opportunity to mentor the younger people. So I used to have, we have uh, a bullpen and some offices around the bullpen and I used to be in one of those offices around the bullpen. It's so boring. So I moved out into the bullpen, and it's just so much more enjoyable. Uh, so the, the, the guy right next to me just finished college a few months ago. Um, and so we're having conversations every, you know, all day, every day. We don't do the same work. So I'm learning from him as he's learning from the, the, the team that he works on, uh, which is the indirect investing, investing team. And he's learning from me, but not because that's our job. It's just because we sit next to each other. So it's really, really kind of great. The one person who works directly for me works from Charleston. And in fact, there's a little office there, terrible little building with uh, seven people, I think, working in it. He loves it. Um, so in that case, you know, I, I talk to him all day, every day. We don't work physically together. That works only because he wouldn't move to, to Northern Virginia. And he's good enough that I, that, uh, that I pushed to have him hired anyway. So, uh, so that's, that's sort of what Middleburg is, is like. Our main focus is what we call middle market class A properties. We don't do student housing. It's not that we wouldn't rent to students. We don't build, build housing for students. We don't do elderly housing, same thing. Okay? It's not that we wouldn't rent to an elderly uh, renter. It's just we don't build housing for them. Um, we don't do luxury properties. We do some affordable and what we call workplace, workforce properties. In fact, yesterday in, in the Atlanta area, I was looking at a site that we're considering for a workforce property. And it's, an, it's actually interesting. We went to a source of capital and said, we've got this project that I think you'll be interested in. Um, and, uh, and here's where it is. And they said, oh, that's a terrible place. We don't want to be there. We said, well, hold on a second. Let's think, let, let, us, let us give you some more information about this location. And they came back and said, wow, we're totally convinced. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but it happened in this particular um, situation. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how we evaluate a location because the goal is not to find the same location that everybody else already found. The goal is also not to find a crappy location. I, I, I apologize. Sometimes I'll slip into words that I shouldn't be using um, in a situation like this. But we don't, we don't want to find a bad location. Okay? We do want to find a good location that no one else realizes is good until we point out why we think it's good. Um, so our bread and butter is this middle market class A. It's for employed people without tremendously high incomes. It's typically going to be in a suburban part of a major metro area. Um, it's not going to be a high rise. It's going to be a four story. In fact, uh, I should move to that slide. Um, but we also do single family rental housing communities. And we do that a little bit differently than other people. This is a brand new part of the market. People only started building single family rental communities a, a, a short time ago. What we are doing is a little bit different from what other people are doing because a lot of single family rental housing is just housing that was built to sell and then they couldn't sell it so they said well let's rent it instead what we are doing is <coughs> a community that has the same amenities as one of our multifamily housing communities except that they're single family houses and we don't think that this is going to be the house that you want to live in the rest of your life it's the house that you want to rent while you know until you're ready for something bigger so what we are so our single family houses we call cottages they're smaller they're basically for the early stages of your family life where you want the want the four walls to yourselves but you don't need the extra space no one rents the house that they're going to move to grow into plenty of people buy the house that they're going to grow into we're trying to give them a reason not to bother. We're trying to give them a reason to say, all right, let's rent this cottage instead. And then when, we're ready, when we have grown out of that cottage, we'll get something bigger. Okay, so that's about the company. And so let me talk, let me just mention, I'm not gonna go through this very much. This is just from some of our, some of our investor materials about our, our typical community. So I say, so you know, this is, this is it's a four-story community with several buildings in it. Um, 
It's, uh, it's a controlled access, air-conditioned corridors, uh, elevators. We also do workforce housing, which looks a lot like this, except that it's going to be three stories or maybe two, and it's not going to have elevators. It's going to be walk-up instead. But a lot, a lot of it is the same. As I said, not luxury stuff, but it's the kind of stuff you would be happy to live in, okay? Unless you had a million dollars and wanted a three-story penthouse that you could triple the size of when you talk to your lenders. No one got that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is not worth talking very much about, but, but you get the idea of what we're, what we're developing. Let me talk about my role. I am the chief economist. It is very rare for a company like ours to have an economist. Sometimes they will have somebody whose job title has the word economist in it. And typically it's because they like took at least one economics class as an undergraduate. Okay, that's not me. Okay, Middleburg is, is trying to use an economist in three ways. One, to provide support for strategic decisions that are made by the chief executive officer and the chief investment officer. The second is to do a really good job of evaluating locations. We actually had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a much larger company with much greater resources who, and they wanted to show us how they evaluate locations. And they assumed they were talking to the company with the economist who had one undergraduate class in economics. And so they started making this presentation, and the questions I was asking, and like, oh, this is not the audience we thought we were having. It's very rare for a company like mine to do uh, location evaluation of, in the way that we do it. And so that's what I want to talk about some. And the last piece of it is external visibility. Um, to get the message across to potential investors that we do have these capabilities that most companies don't have. There is a reason to choose to invest with Middleburg instead of with the company, with the economist, with the, the one undergraduate class, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit more about each of these. So here's an example of strategic decision support. It's not just for the CEO and the CIO. This is something that I, that I you know, do, I try to do it at least once a month. It's simply an email that goes out to every person in the company. The people who sit at the front desk renting out apartments, the people who fix the, the broken, broken toilets in the apartments, everybody in the company gets this email that says, here's what's happening in the macro economy. Here's what I think it means, both for us and for the country as a whole. Here are the things that are gonna be coming up soon that I think are gonna be important to us. And here are just some, uh, some additional ways to think about these things. So for example, um, uh, you know, uh, people, are, people are talking recently about um, the slope of the yield curve. What does that mean? Okay, what, wh how do we use the slope of the yield curve? How do you define it? How do you find the information for it? So this is, most of the people who receive this information are not going to make use of it. But they really do seem to enjoy being in part of that conversation. Okay, so that's just a minor piece of, of the, the uh, internal sort of, making the company a company that makes use of this kind of information. Um, I do macroeconomic forecasting. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And, um, and I do some support for the asset management people, so hedonic rent modeling, which means you've got a three-bedroom, uh, one-bath apartment you know, with a dog park and, and, uh, and what's it called, valet trash collection and things, you know, the following amenities in this location how much should we be charging in rent for that place? Okay, so we can always settle on the right rent by trying several things that don't work and getting there eventually. The goal is to get there right, right from the beginning rather than doing, doing a lot of trial and error. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, deci the strategic decision support. In terms of location evaluation, we're paying attention to you know, how rents change, how basically real estate fundamentals change in each of the markets that we operate in, and I'll talk a lot more about this. And in terms of external vis visibility, so one of the things that I do is try to, try to produce a little bit longer form research reports that we put up on our website. They're useful for internal purposes, but they're also a way of displaying to potential investors, you know, that we think a little bit more carefully than other companies do about these sorts of things. Anyone have any questions so far about, about sort of what I've been saying about the company as a whole and my general role in it? 
You got any questions? It's gonna make it fun. Yeah. What's your name? It's Carl William. Carl. Nice Carl. 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 Carl William or Carl? Carl William. All right. Is the groundbreaking developments newsletter? Is that? something that potentially us as students could subscribe to? So I'm not gonna, it's not something to subscribe to. It is, it is I send it to, I use the uh, all, um, you know, list to send it to everybody in the company. It's not something we protect. So some people do send it outside of the company, but we don't have a list aside from the company's email list. It's fun though, I, it's fun for me to write. I wish I could write it once a, once a week. That's what I used to do when I used to be at Fannie Mae. Um, but there, it went only to a small select group of people. I love the idea that I'm getting calls, because at the end of it, it says, you have questions about this? You know, here's how to contact Brad. So I get calls from, from people who, they've never been part of the conversation about you know, why these macroeconomic things matter. So, yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. I haven't met you yet. No, my name's Josh. Josh. Um, that's nice to meet you. Thank you for coming and taking time to speak to this Dr. Case. Um, I did uh, economics undergrad here at UF, and I was just wondering... Oh, so you're ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, fair. Um, so I was just wondering, what data points, when you're selecting a location um, for your property, which data points have the highest correlation with success for the types of properties that you develop? Hold off on that. That's, that's a bunch of what I'll talk about. Okay. What's your name? Ruben. Ruben? Yes. Okay. As a vertically integrated developer? Yeah, but development is part of what we do. Okay. It, but it is sort of the thing that defines us. Okay. A vertically integrated company, what are the main reasons you rent the properties? So you build for rent and you do not build for sale yeah. per unit. Yeah. So listen, this is, this is a really important question. You know, if you're near the beginning of your career, you should keep this in mind. So years ago, I went to a, a, an investment presentation by a publicly traded read called, I think it was Home Properties. But, and, and they said in their presentation, our niche is to buy C plus quality apartment buildings and renovate them to B minus quality. And I thought, this is awesome in two ways. Number one, they know what they're good at. Number two, they're not trying to impress people. They're saying, this is what we're good at, and this is what we're gonna do because we're good at it. You don't do something, you don't, you don't say you're good at it because you wanna do it. You do it because you're good at it, okay? And too many people in, not just real estate, but certainly, especially in real estate, they say that they're good at it because that's what they wanna do. Why do we build housing for rent? Because that's what we're good at. That's the entire reason. Why don't we do student housing? We're not good at it. Why don't we do elderly housing? We're not good at it. Why do we do middle market class A? Because we, we are good at it. We have tried, we have done some other things. We, you know, we do, we do occasionally do workforce housing. Not very good at it, okay? The great thing about affordable housing is there's a counter cyclical component there, okay? So you can really, you can really, um, make things a little bit e more uh, even for your company through time by having more than one capability. But every time you branch out into a different capability, you're probably going into something that you're not as good at. Back in the 70s, there was a wave of leveraged buyouts of companies that had gotten involved in too many different things because they figured, well, we're probably good at everything. And they were not. They were good at one thing and they were doing 100 other things that were losing money. That is still true today. It's just that most of the time, when, when we hear about you know, uh, um, Elon Musk buying something else, we figure, well, he's such an amazing guy, he's probably good at everything. He's not. He's just got a big, huge pile of money. That's it. We would rather use our pile of money for something that we're really good at. Yeah. Uh, Jack. Okay. So there, yeah, there are two reasons. One is, yeah, we're very familiar with the Southeast. Our, our CEO uh, grew up in the Southeast. Um, I didn't. I'm like, Florida? Where's that? Um, uh, but the other reason is there is so much uh, migration to the Southeast. So, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to growth and demand, and there's nothing that drives growth and demand more, more surely than steady migration, in migration. So yeah, we, you know, we, we, we're not active in San Francisco, partly because we don't know San Francisco, but partly because people are getting out of there. 
Yeah. Build to rent communities that you're building. How many of them have you been able to stabilize? Surf all so we have zero. We all of ours are under construction or development. Okay. Now. And then second question, lead because of that, what's the institutional capital's appetite for build to rent? Communities? So on our build to rent community, there is tremendous institutional appetite. Um, so we, have, I think I'm right in saying this. We have two different programmatic joint ventures, two different large investors who said we want everything that you can do in this part of the country. And the other one, everything you do in this part of the country. You know, I'm talking about different states within our territory. And a third one who came in and said, we want everything you do, period. And they, they weren't offering uh, good enough terms for us to, to give up those, those two existing programmatic joint ventures. So that's not because we have proven ourselves to be better than everybody else at build to rent communities. It's because there's tremendous institutional appetite for it. Yeah. Is that Max? Yeah. Okay. Predicting disposition cap rates um, is always quite difficult. How are you currently predicting future cap rates considering uh, today's market conditions? So it's not just difficult. It is functionally impossible. It's a stupid thing to try to do. Now, we do it. But I can't say, I as a research economist cannot say that the way we do it is better than any, the way anybody else does it. What I can say is that we don't fiddle with the exit cap rate to meet the, the criteria that some investor is hoping to see. We have a way of figuring the exit cap rate and we apply that. And we go to the, the investor and they say, well, we want it to be you know, a little bit better. Why don't you reduce the cap rate? We just, that's not how we do it. But it is essentially impossible to do it. However, one thing we can do is do a better job of evaluating the differences in cap rates between markets. And so that's what I do. I say, all right, I, I'm not going to do a very good job of predicting the national average cap rate. But I can say that in this market, it should be 20 basis points less. And in this one, it should be 13 basis points more. That's, that's the sort of place where we try to get a better, a better way of doing, the, doing things on cap rates. Yeah. Andrew. So all your properties a couple of years ago, did you guys predict a recession or? Um, we predicted that there was a lot of uncertainty and that prices were really good. They were really good. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it does, it's like, you know, would you, would, you, would you buy stock in Tesla right now? Well, it may go up a lot. What's more likely? What's more likely is it's, it'll collapse. Okay, so all you can do is play the percentages. Nobody can predict the future with, with, uh, in terms of the financial markets, okay? In 2020 and 2021, the percentages were sell everything you can get your hands on to sell. You know, develop so that you have more to sell. Yeah. All right. Should we talk more? All right. So let's talk a little bit, little bit more carefully about each of these. So uh, let's start with recession probability. This is, this is, you know, it's not a key part of what we do, but it's so fun. Um, so I have a, a recession probability model that I update, um, I guess it's six times a month, because it's based on six categories of variables. So every time a new variable gets reported that month, I, re -up I update my, my probability of, of recession model. And uh, what's great about this is um, I, you know, I want to use it to, to talk to the CEO and the CIO and saying, all right, recession's coming, let's get defensive you know, let's make sure we don't go bankrupt as a result of it, okay? Um, or there's not a recession. Let's, let's like stop obsessing about the possibility of a recession and actually get some work done. So for the last year and a half, my CEO a year and a half ago started saying, we're going into a recession if we're not in one already and it's gonna be a bad one and we're gonna get through it, don't worry. And I'm in the background saying, we're not going into a recession. Like, and I kept on telling him, look, I, it's, it's not the recession won't happen. I guarantee you there will be a recession. But it is not on the horizon, meaning there is no data that tell us that we're going to recession. So I'd tell them, look, as soon as the data tell us we're going to a recession, I will let you know. Then in April and May of this year, um, the data did say that we were going to a recession. And what did I did, do? I told them, I don't believe the data. Because what was happening in April of May and May of that year of, of this past year, 
of this year is that housing starts and permits, which are an important part of my model, collapsed. And previously, when you saw a collapse that severe, it was before the great financial crisis. I just didn't think that, that, that it was really a good anal historical analog. So I, I do that, I, I update this all the time, and I talk about it with you know, the entire company, but especially the CEO and the CIO. But there's always gonna be an element of judgment here. Okay, what you gotta be careful of, of is not saying, well, I think we're going into a recession, or I think we're not going into a recession, based on which party you, want, you hope will, will win the White House. That's what was happening in the spring of last year. People were saying, I hope the Republicans win, so therefore, it looks like we're going into a bad recession, we better vote, vote for the Republicans. That's not how to do economic forecasting. So that's what I'm trying to get the company away from. And in your career, just keep in mind, don't forecast something because you hope it'll happen or because you hope it'll trigger something else that you hope will happen. Forecast something because that's the most likely thing that, is, that, that will happen. You'll be wrong much of the time. The point of a forecast is not to be right, it's to do a good forecast. Okay? All right. Uh, and that's all I'm gonna say about the macroeconomy. So if we, if we wanna chat about the macroeconomy, now's the time. Okay. All right, um, so let's talk about the location evaluation and targeting part of what I do. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll talk, this, talk, talk about, and, and in fact, I'm not, I'm not gonna say anything more about the external visi visibility part. I mean, after all, I'm demonstrating it right now, right? All right, um, so we, okay, this is our approach to location evaluation. So basically, we want to do a better job than everybody else at forecasting demand for our product. Not for rental housing in particular, for our product. We want to do a better job of it than everybody else <coughs> of forecasting new supply of our product. Um, and we want to do that in very small areas. <coughs> so, so remember the way that our process works is we have a land acquisition team. They're based in Charleston. And for all of our states, they, they will screen properties. And if they have a property that looks like it might work, then they give it to the, to the underwriting team. The underwriting team sort of gets a, a, a basic sketch of what could possibly happen here. All right, how much is that gonna cost? What kind of rents are we gonna be able to charge, okay? If it still looks good, then we actually try to acquire the property. Okay, but for every property that survives that first screening, you've probably started with 25 properties that you, that, that, that you were looking at, seriously looking at, okay? Every property, for, for all of the, for every property that goes past the first screening to where we actually start trying to negotiate a purchase of the property, probably another 25 that didn't get past that first screening, okay? So there's this enormous funnel that results in one property being bought, okay? We don't wanna be spending all that time on properties that are on pieces of land that aren't gonna work. So what my goal is to say, all right, look here, because it's fairly likely that if you find a piece of land, it'll be something that we can build successfully on, okay? Don't look here, because you may find a piece of land, but it'll be too expensive, or we won't get the entitlements, or things like that. So we're, it's all about making that, that part of our, what we do more efficient so that the underwriting team, instead of underwriting 1,000 possible deals, is underwriting 100 possible deals right, to come up with one that really, really works. Okay, so I'm gonna talk more about each of, these, each of the pieces of this, starting with the demand forecasting. So, uh, so we actually, um, we subscribe to forecasts that come from, in, in our case, it's a company called Oxford Economics. Uh, they produce forecasts. Um, of key demand drivers like employment growth, uh, population growth by age group, okay? Because I'm not interested in population growth in the 65 and up, okay? I'm interested in population growth in the 25 to 35, or 25 to 40, okay? Because those are the people who are looking to rent an apartment rather than looking to buy a house or to, to get a place in, a, in, a, in an assisted living facility. So I'm, I'm, I'm using forecasts that come from Oxford Economics. That's not what this is, because we don't want to depend on forecasts that come from somebody else. 
we think we can do better forecasts because they're doing this all over the world. We're operating in eight states and effectively only seven. Okay, so, and, and, I, and I want to be able to understand the relationships between different, different places better than I can just by looking at what they produce and saying, all right, they like this one, but not this one. I wonder why. So what we are in the middle of doing is replacing our Oxford economics forecasts with our own forecasts, and that's what we're looking at here. So I picked two counties, um, both in the Tampa Bay uh, area, okay? And I picked these two counties because their forecasts look so different. These are, it says for, a forecast of employment. It's not, it, I have to, you know, I, 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 I cheated a little bit. It's actually forecasts of the employed population. So it may be that jobs are growing, growing really well in Pinellas County, but all the people taking those jobs are going to come from Hillsborough County. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is my forecasts indicate much stronger growth in the employed, prop, employed population in Hillsborough County than in Pinellas County. So several months ago when our land acquisition team said, all right, we're going to go, go uh, make a trip down to look at pieces of land in St. Petersburg, I said, let's change the focus a little bit of that trip uh, because I think there are going to be more opportunities not in St. Petersburg, but near St. Petersburg and other parts of that metro area. So these happen to be forecasts at the county level. My ultimate goal will be to try to make forecasts at, at smaller than the county level. At the moment, I don't have the data to do that. Um, and certainly, I, I don't get forecasts at smaller than the county level from Oxford Economics. So I'm just saying, I, my first step is to replace what we're buying from somebody else with something that we can do even better. My second step is to do that a little bit better by getting a little bit more geographically disaggregated. But it's not easy to do. Okay, so that's the first step in doing our demand forecasting is, is forecasting some of those key drivers of growth in demand for our product. Um, so I do forecasts like this for, you know, growth in the young adult population um, uh, and, you know, various, various other drivers of demand. Um, yeah, here's the young adult population. So you, again, you see this tremendous difference in the forecast paths for these two counties that are right next to each other. Okay, Pinellas County. I don't know why. I've never been there. Never been there. Okay, so can somebody tell me why Pinellas County is a, a bad place to develop relative to Hillsborough County? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, from experience, I'm from there. A bunch of old people are coming out from up north who have a lot of money and just buying beach houses and just moving down because they don't retire by the beach. And that's Pinellas, not Hillsborough? I mean, more than in Hillsborough? I've seen a lot in Pinellas for old people who don't even want to stay on the beach and more moving in yeah. because of the travel. Yeah, you know, when I, first, when I first arrived at this company, they were talking about buying, about developing something in Daytona Beach. Now, I got nothing against Daytona Beach, but I'm like, what? It looked to me like there's tremendous growth in Daytona Beach among old people. That's not useful to us except to the extent that old people use medical services and we rent to people who work in the hospitals. Okay, that is interesting to me. But that's exactly the kind of differentiation I want to do. I don't, I don't want to look at population growth. I want to look at growth in the population that is likely to be interested in renting our places. Yeah. Oh. oh, in St. Petersburg? Yeah, because I worked in the office like two, three years, so um, that's like a lot of uh, big hospital, uh -huh. um, medical office. It's a hub for a lot of doctors and specialists being there. All right, so the old people are moving to St. Petersburg to take advantage of the hospitals, and the young people are moving into Hillsboro to work in the hospitals in St. Petersburg. Yes, sir. I, see, that's the kind of story that, you know, that I come up with when I look closely at the data, and it really matters to us because we're not interested in housing the old people. We're housing, interested in housing the nurses and, and people like that. Yeah. I actually brought up just both three lots of the same thing. So what's the age that you're looking at? Who wants to invest with him? <laughs> yeah. What's the age bracket that you're looking at? I think my might happen in the same thing, but it's going to be expensive. Well, that's true in a lot of places. Yeah, so one of the things we do pay attention to is the rent to income ratio and the rent to house price in, uh, ratio. You know, so, so we do pay attention to a bunch of other things. Um, but in terms of the age group, so 25 to 35 for our rental, uh, for our multifamily, 
and like 25 to 40 or 30, or, or 30 to 40 for the single family residential. We just think there's just a little bit of an older cohort that's going to be interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Three hundred thousand. That's uh, seven hundred. Yeah. So it's just not unaffordable for that yeah. age range. Yeah. Uh, that's that's <laughs> true. All of them. Um, okay. So uh, so now I want to talk about supply forecasting, but in particular we forecast oversupply issues. Oversupply issues are are big around our part of the country. Throughout the south southeast, there are oversupply issues in certain markets. Not everywhere. But it's interesting to look at the difference between markets that are oversupplied and markets that are undersupplied. So here is just a summary table of all of the markets in Florida um, with, with my latest estimates of the oversupply situation in each of those markets. And what I mean by that is over the next three years, how many more uh, units will be supplied than will be demanded? That's oversupply. If it's negative, then it's more demand than supply relative to the existing housing stock. So the most oversupplied uh, metro area in the entire state of Florida, Homosassa Springs. I've never been there, okay? The least oversupplied, the villages. I hope never to go there, okay? Um, but, but there is a pattern here. And the oversupply issues are worst in the places that look best, okay? Why are they oversupplied? Because they look good, okay? You can't get away from that. We want to be better than everybody else at evaluating locations, but that's very different from being the only ones who realize that a location is good. If it's clearly a good location, other people will have noticed it too. You just can't get away from that. At the other end of the scale, a place like, home, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to diss anyone's hometown, but my guess is that there's no oversupply situation because no one in their right mind would try to build what we're trying to build in Homosassa Springs. Okay, so if we cared only about oversupply, we'd go to these places that, from the point of view of an economist evaluating data from his office in Northern Virginia, look like crap. Okay, so again, sorry if I diss dissed anyone's hometown. But this is, this is sort of a summary of the oversupply situation. And I just highlighted Gainesville and, and Tampa. Uh, Tampa because, um, you know, it's that, it's that good example of, you know, Tampa has both Hillsborough and Pinellas as well as a couple of other counties in that metro area. Gainesville because I'm here. You know, that's, that's the only reason. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about how we um, put these data together. Um, and, and this is an important thing. Remember I was talking about sort of, you know, supporting strategic decision making, not just at the CEO or CIO level, but throughout the company. So the, this information we put on dashboards that are available to not everybody in the company because we actually pay for the licenses, but to a lot of people. We want a lot of people to understand this is why we're thinking about making this decision to build here and this decision not to build here. So we, uh, so the top Top section, we are trying to evaluate incremental demand over the next three years based on our forecast of changes in, in the number of households in that location, along with our analysis of the number of households per adult. I'm sorry, what I meant is we're going to forecast the number of, forecast the growth in the adult population and then apply our analysis of the number of households per adult to figure out a forecast of the number of households, a population-based forecast of the number of, of, uh, of households that will be demanded in the future. Now, part of that is informal units. So we're facing an entire rental community, an entire group of people who may want to rent. But some of them are renting you know, the, the, the garage um, in, near, you know, in front of somebody's house. Okay, nothing wrong with that. We're not competing with those people but I do have to keep track of them. So that's, the, that's what I'm calling the informal um, units. Okay, the, the next band, the orange band, is doing the same thing, but forecasting employment, or employed residents, and saying, all right, how many rental housing units are needed per employed resident? So we've got two different ways of, of estimating the number of additional uh, rental housing, formal rental housing units that are needed in that particular location. Okay, then I'm just taking an average of those, and I'm taking into account then 
All right, are we well above or well below the normal vacancy rate for this market? We need to adjust for that. Because sometimes, you know, some of the new supply will just be getting us back to the, to the, to the normal uh, uh, vacancy rate. And we don't, wanna, we don't wanna assume that the current vacancy rate is gonna stay that way forever. Vacancy rates changed a lot during the COVID pandemic. And we, we, wanna, we wanna be cognizant of the danger of assuming that the vacancy rate will stay will stay uh, stable. Okay, so now, so I've got, I end up with uh, annual, um, uh, in this case for Tampa, I'm saying that over the next three years, 4.2% of the original, uh, of the current housing stock will be additional incremental demand. All right, what about supply? Well, I look at the number of units that are under construction. I look at housing permits over the last, last year or so. And I have two different models um, to say, all right, given that amount of housing cons uh, under construction and given the number of permits and given how long it takes to build something, which is a very important piece of it because that has changed dramatically over the years. That's, that's gonna give me two different ways of estimating the incremental supply coming onto the market over the next three years. And then just subtract one of those from the other, and it gives me an estimate of oversupply in that market. At the moment, this oversupply is only at the metro level. I've actually done it at the county level, but I don't, like, I, I want to make sure that it's high quality before I actually deploy it for decision-making purposes. But this is what we do sort of for every one of the 121 metro areas in our, in our part of the country, um, is to come up with this oversupply. Now, so you notice that Gainesville, it says it's, says it's undersupplied. Well, that's great, right? Doesn't matter to us. This is not a market that, that we're gonna be interested in, in, in being in. And I'll show you why. Okay, so that's how we do um, our oversupply analysis. Any questions about this? And, and one thing I should say is, you know, we've got a couple of different ways of estimating demand, a couple of different ways of estimating supply. The idea is to, is to form what we call an, ense an, an ensemble forecast. Have some high quality um, forecasts and then combine them, give, putting the appropriate weight on each of them to get the best, best possible uh, forecast. Again, the best possible forecast is not going to be right. The point is to be useful. Yeah, Anna. So when you say oversupply or undersupply of your product that you're trying to develop, or is it like rental units in general? It's rental units, it's formal rental units in general. So rental units that are not just owned by the guy up the street. It, it is, it should not be. I haven't yet come up with a way that I think is good enough to exclude either student housing or elderly housing. So I do, I do it for all of rental housing and then separately I evaluate, is this really a student market? Is this really a, a, uh, an elderly market? Yeah. Where do you all pull the data from? So several sources, one of them is CoStar. Um, CoStar's data is terrible. Um, <laughs> but it's, all, it's better than most of the other possible sources. Uh, it, it, essentially, it's better than every other possible source. Um, more importantly, our asset managers use CoStar. So I am not gonna subscribe to a different service when I already have access to this one that's good enough. Um, so our two main outside sources of data are Oxford Economics for the forecasts and CoStar for the information about the housing market. And uh, uh, I make a lot of use of publicly available data. Some use of data that are not intended to be publicly available, but I can make them so. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but a lot of it comes from CoStar. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Uh, yeah. You Wait. Ruben. <laughs> Have you established any information systems that can actually put all the data that you are using in relational databases for automation of these purposes? Yeah. So the answer is right in there. Um, uh, a year ago, we hired, some, hired a group of people separately, but they were people who knew each other, um, one of whom that was her main job. Um, that group of people, in our, in our business, in our company, we have a no assholes policy, explicit. Um, it's easy to say that, doesn't mean it's true in, in effect. In our company, it is. And that group of people violated that policy. 
And so we no longer have an active program along those lines. We do have an active intention to get back to it with the right person. Don't repeat that. <laughs> Other questions? And by the way, she was not the main issue. She was just tied to the main issue. So. All right. All right, so let's talk about our, our small area scoring. Somebody was asking about, about this. Um, so we, we use a nonlinear machine learning uh, process to, uh, to score our locations. So we, we try, to, uh, try to develop a bunch of different data from different sources. So for example, going from the top, five-year growth in the 25 to 35-year-old population. At the moment, that is coming from Oxford Economics. We're trying to replace it with our own, uh, own forecast, but we haven't done the quality control yet. Um, Five-year absorption of, of units going forward, That's, that comes from COSTAR. Um, and so the, the Oxford data is at the county level. COSTAR data is at the sub-market level. Um, population density, that's just a descriptive piece of information from the, from the Census Bureau. That's at the block group level. Do you know what a block group is? Okay, so the, the you know, counties are divided into census tracts, and each census tract is divided into one or more, typically three, typically two, or two or three block groups. And then under that are blocks. There's very little data available at the block level. But there is a bunch of data available at the block group level. It's old. Census Bureau doesn't, doesn't uh, publish data very often. But for our purposes, all we're trying to say is, how does this location differ from that other location? So I don't care that the population growth in a particular location, population density in a particular location has changed over time. What I care about is it's much more dense here than here. And what's this giving us? It's telling us, all right, here's a location that you're probably going to do a high rise in. Not what we do. Not, not that we can't do it. We're not going to bother. Mid rise here. Again, we're not really going to bother. Um, or or uh, you know, single family residential. Oh, we care about that. That's an entirely different location from where we're thinking about putting our four story elevator apartments. So we're paying attention to population density in part to say, all right, what kind of property development should we be thinking about here? We also do townhouses. So that's, again, a different kind of location. Um, the rentership rate. Somebody was asking what's, what's especially important. People in my company hate the idea that, we, that I pay attention to the rentership rate. What, and you know, their way of thinking is, you ought to be going to some place where they really want renter housing and they don't have it. Well, you know why they don't have it? Because they don't want it. So the rentership rate typically is telling us that the local government does not want you to put renter, rental housing there. Okay, so yeah, you may be able to pull it off if you put enough work into it. But let's focus on the places where it's going to be easier to develop rental housing. That's why we pay attention to the rentership rate. And again, this is something that comes from the Census Bureau. So it's out of date. That doesn't matter. We're just saying, all right, here, the rental housing works. Here, it doesn't work. It's not that it couldn't work. It's just that it's not going to be worth the effort. OK. Um, yeah. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> this, you recognize what I'm looking at, right? OK. These are called SHAP values. When you do machine learning, machine learning uh, is, a, is, a, is a whole bunch of different models which are nonlinear, meaning the importance of one factor may depend on the, on the value of a different factor. Okay? They're very complicated. So the question is, all right, how do you evaluate how important something is um, in a very complicated modeling situation? And so the SHAP value is basically saying, all right, if we do this, if we sample these data a whole bunch of different times and estimate the, estimate the, uh, the, the values, then this, this reflects how much, um, how closely the output values, which are the scores in this case, depend on the input values of that variable. So the, the, value, the variables at the top of the list are almost always really important. The variables at the bottom of the list have only very small importance. And so one of the things that, um, that I, uh, oh, we don't even, oh, this, this is not a complete table. So if you go farther down on the table, there's the quality of the schools. People in my company hate the idea that schools don't matter. 
Well, let me tell you, schools don't matter in this part of the country. Yeah? Um, my question is, does the model have the ability to adjust itself moving forward, or you have to like manually change the uh, partial model underneath it, like each time you know, you're trying to adjust for something else? No, we, we, we have it set up so that we can re-estimate the model every quarter. Uh, we update the data every quarter. We re-estimate the model. We can re-estimate it anytime we want. We've just decided that that, that, that quarterly frequency is, is, is more, much more than good enough for our purposes. So it's not the model that changes. It's the, it's the, data, it's the underlying data that changes, and we re-estimate it, and we come up with new scores every quarter. But obviously, they don't change very much. If they did change a lot, you would worry. They don't change very much. Um, now, the stuff on the right is, is saying, all right, um, uh, and, and it's confusing because red means it's positive. Blue means it's negative. So what this is saying is for 25 to 35-year-olds, the stronger the growth in that, in that category, the higher the score is. That's exactly what we're trying to get at. Um, for the population density, the lower the population density, the higher the score in general. And remember, we don't do high rises. Okay, so so again, this sort of this sort of makes sense, but it is complicated. You know, this is this is in fact, in fact, uh, we have <laughs> we have never told our CEO that we do this because we think he would be horrified by the thought. And I'll tell you one word we never used is REIT. He knows. Uh, you know, have you learned from Professor Ling that uh, private equity real estate companies like mine have systematically underperformed relative to publicly traded REITs in real estate going back to the late 1970s? Okay, that is true. My CEO hates hearing that. So we do not use the word REIT. But I'll tell you, one of the main things that I do is I pay attention to mid-Atlantic apartment communities because they are a very well-run REIT that has a portfolio that looks a lot like our portfolio. Okay, so if I want to know what's happening in, to the kinds of properties that we do, I look at what's happening to mid-Atlantic mid or mid-American, MAA. So, okay. So what does this come up with? Oh, yeah. No, this, is, this model is estimated across all markets. Okay, same, same model. Every block group has its own data. So we're estimating this for 55,000 block groups, but it's the same model across all block groups. Okay, would you guys like different markets? So you mean volatility of property values? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. No, I have not done that. I, 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 and that won't be a high priority. It's an interesting thing to think about, but I, but I likely won't be thinking about it. <laughs> That's the difference between working at a college and working. <laughs> David will think about it. <laughs> All right, yeah. imply future success and so are you basically back testing this on like previous data data and then trying to see how that data yeah. impacts the future so, so this is what we do and again i i don't tell this to my ceo my ceo is you know a lot of real estate people are like is this a good spot yes how do you know because i feel it in my gut that's him he he likes the idea that we can make better decisions he just doesn't believe that other better decisions are actually possible so he'll allow me to look for them, but he doesn't want to hear about it. So, um, so specifically, what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, where are the locations of other properties that have been developed quite recently that appear to be successful analogs of what we want to develop? Okay, because what we want is to find other areas that have the same characteristics. So that's what we're trying to do. He hates the idea of trying to figure out 
where other people have built stuff and saying, well, that must be a good spot. Because in his point of view, from his point of view, there are no places that he hasn't built. So I have to, I have to work around that. You know, that's a psychological thing. He pays my salary. So that's, you know, that's a burden that I have to carry in, in order to keep, uh, keep employed. <laughs> but that is specifically what we are modeling. We are effectively trying to say, all right, show me all of the places that are very similar to these, to the places where these properties were developed because that's what I want to emulate. Somebody else? Yeah. Wait. Um, uh. Hey, Dimitri. Dimitri. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so obviously when we were speaking before, we were talking a lot about your economic, strong economics background, macro and all that kind of stuff, and we see how this kind of ties into you know, the institutional side of things. And I love it. I think this gives you an upper hand over a lot of the research and the data that a lot of traditional companies are using. Like you remind me of the Billy Bean, like money ball of like the real estate world. I love it. And why hasn't more word gotten through the industry to employ this depth? Of research. Because people are like my CEO. But he still has you. He doesn't like what you're saying all the time, but he still got you. It's really the CIO who's pushing for it. Uh, you know, and that's literally true. I don't think he would spend the money on his own. He is happy to spend the money given that the, that the CIO, my direct boss, uh, really wants it. Um, and so, but real estate is a business in which people trust their gut. And I'll tell you. So one of the things I mentioned when I first got to this company, they were, they were looking at, at developing in Daytona Beach. And I said, well, think again. Um, and another place they were thinking of developing was Chattanooga. I'm like, what? So then I went to a, a conference, and everyone was talking about Chattanooga. I'm like, I've missed something. So I went back and looked at the data. And believe me, I didn't miss anything. Um, and Chattanooga does not look like an appealing place to me. And I, was, and I was saying that, but I was being careful about saying that. And finally, I went to a conference, and, and, and I was asking, like, what's so great about Chattanooga? And they said, oh, it's a wonderful place to spend the weekend. OK, that's really different from building rental housing. And so a lot of what happens in this industry is you go to cocktail parties, and you hear what other people are saying. And when they say, oh, Chattanooga is awesome, you say, I want to build something in Chattanooga. And you immediately start telling that story to your investors, saying, oh, Chattanooga is awesome. So you can get money to build in Chattanooga. What I'm trying to do is say, all right, if you want to build in Chattanooga, OK, here's the little spot in Chattanooga that's worth looking. But why bother with Chattanooga at all? When look at all the possibilities in Atlanta. OK, there are 500 places in Atlanta for every one place in Chattanooga. Plus, my, my ex-sister-in-law lives there, so don't want to be there. Yeah. I'd be curious to know if you consider like psychological kind of uh, aspects, like that kind of herd mentality of, oh, like this person said Chattanooga is good, it must be good, so I'll do it there too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so for example, example, when cap rates first started going up, the story that cap rates were going up made perfect sense. But I have an inherent skepticism. So the first thing I said to the CEO and the CIO is, maybe that's right. Let me dig more deep, deeply, because it is possible that people are just repeating what they heard at the last cocktail party, and it's not really true. Besides, you know, after all, what is a cap rate? Okay, does a cap rate exist? The answer is no, it doesn't exist. Okay, it is an idea. And the idea is the NOI for you know, forward-looking NOI. All right, problem number one, right? We can't look forward. Okay, forward-looking NOI divided by the value of the property. What the hell is the value of the property? Well, you just take the NOA and divide it by the cap rate. Oh my god. And, and let me tell you, one of my dissertation papers was about cap rates. OK, cap rates are the biggest false information in real estate. And so when people talk about cap rates are going up, you got to stop and say, all right, let's see whether that's really true. And if it's true, then it will show up in the capital flows data. So that's what I went to. And it was a few months before I said, yeah, it looks like cap, cap rates have actually gone up, and here's why. And that suggests whether they're going to continue going up or hold steady or come back down. Anyway, I forgot what your question was, but I was, I, I was happy with my answer regardless. <laughs> OK, should we move on? All right. 
Um, all right, so here's just a summary, and, and this is internal stuff. I, you know, I do not prepare this for presentation, so there are some typos here that we have never bothered to correct. Um, but so, so we're looking at our scores um, for markets in, in, in my part of the country. So we score every census block group, again, 55,000 of them, on a score of 0 to 1. Um, and then we pay attention only to those places that score above 0.8. It's not that we will not build outside of those locations. We won't put the effort into finding places to build outside of those locations. Okay, so, but this is giving us some information, some summary information about what are things like in those locations. And you, have to, you have to keep in mind some of this data is not up-to-date data. The top line is a cross-sectional comparison of median rent from the, most, from the previous U.S. Census comparing locations. So the median rents are quite low. Uh, down below that, it says Class A effective rent per unit. That's CoStar data from, you know, from, much, from this quarter, or I guess, yeah, it was the beginning of this quarter. So, uh, so, we're, so what we're looking for, uh, you know, you're going you're to be building in places that currently have a median rent in the 1800 to 1950 range. Um, rentership rate is very important. Again, people in my company hate the fact that rentership rate is important, but it is. Okay, because you can actually get things done in a place with a good solid rentership rate. Um, percent employed. Okay, again, we're not student housing providers. We're not elderly housing providers. We're providers of housing to people who have jobs. Okay, so we so we are looking looking at places with uh, with a lot of employed people. I'm not going to go through most of this, um, but generally speaking, what this you know the the summary numbers that you see here are the kind of patterns that you would like to see, the, the kind of patterns that give you some confidence that your scoring model is finding, finding uh, the places that you'd like to think about. Is your, is your rentership rate just one minus ownership rate? Yeah, I don't, I don't do, deal with homeownership rates, for God's sake. What is the homeownership rate? The homeownership rate is defined as the number of non-renting households divided by the total number of households. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, now we want to target those top scoring block groups. So here I'm, I'm looking, so this is again from our, our um, dashboard that makes this data available to people in the company. Uh, not everybody, but, but a lot of people in the company. So it's hard to see the way this is uh, screened, but anything that is white is a location with a score below 0.8. 8. Anything that is any shade of blue is above 0.8. And the darker the blue, the more appealing that location is. And anything that has no color at all, we're not dealing with It's not part of a metro area. So number one, that means we don't have the data that we do for places that are parts of metro areas. Number two, we can already tell. We're not going to build something in the middle of nowhere. Okay? So, so for example, um, you know, Orlando. When I first got to this company, they were not looking at Orlando at all. I'm like, are you joking? And they're like, what's so great about Orlando? People go to see Mickey Mouse, that's it. Like, have you looked at the number of people who are, going, who are moving there to take jobs in Orlando? It's spectacular. So now we have at least two projects in Orlando. Um, and uh, Orlando, Lakeland, Tampa, not St. Petersburg, but, um, but that part of Florida is very appealing to us. We've got, I think, two projects in Jacksonville. Um, Jacksonville is not my favorite place, but... Um, but it's, it's certainly good enough for our purposes. Miami looks spectacular. We don't operate in Miami. Okay, we have just made the decision that even though there are great opportunities in, our, in Miami, other people are going to be the ones taking advantage of those. I had a, when, I was, uh, when I was in high school, middle school and high school, my best friend was the son of a hotel developer. And he, and he eventually got into developing casinos in uh, Colorado. And then he went to New Orleans to develop the world's largest land-based casino. And he lost $750 million of his own money. Now, why? It wasn't that it was a bad opportunity. It's that there's a business environment in New Orleans that you're not going to navigate successfully unless you have been part of that community your entire life. And our evaluation of Miami is similar to that. Okay. So, so we score these places. It doesn't mean we're going to look for opportunities there. But let's look a little bit more, more closely at, <coughs> at how we score, score these. So what we're doing here is summarizing all of the block groups in Florida. 
And this chart at the bottom shows the average score by market area. So the highest average, and I, I left uh, the villages off of this. It has the terrific score, as I said. I hope never to go there. Um, so I just left it off the list. Every, every, every other metro area in Florida is included here. Um, Lakeland is the high, is, has the highest average score. So I, I, I actually mentioned that we have two projects in Orlando. At least one of those is actually in the Lakeland metro area, and maybe both of them are. I can't remember. Um, Orlando, number two. Palm Beach, terrific place, and we are not active there, but I am pushing hard for, for us to be active in the Palm Beach metro area. Um, you get it go at the opposite end, you've got Homosassa Springs. Again, maybe a nice place, not a place where we're going to be active at all. Um, Oh, and the other three charts are, are showing a, you know, a very rough regression line, saying, all right, uh, and the, the one in the middle of the top, um, growth in the target, in the target metro, uh, target population group, 25 to 35, relative to uh, the scores. So there are reasons for, uh, for a location to have a low score, even if it has a high forecast growth in the 25 to 35 population. But generally speaking, if you have a lot of growth in that population, it's going to be of interest to us. Generally speaking, if you have low or negative growth in that target population, it's not going to be of interest to us. So these are just ways of summarizing the, the results of this scoring model. OK. So now let's, look, let's go back to, uh, to the Tampa Bay area, to Pinellas and, and Hillsborough County. And, you know, and, and I mean this. If you think these are wrong, I would be interested in hearing about it because I don't spend time in St. Petersburg. Okay? But what this is saying is there is not a single block group in the St. Petersburg metro area, in, the, in Pinellas County, that has a score above 0.8. Doesn't mean we won't build something there. It means we're not going to look for an opportunity there. We are going to look for plenty of opportunities in Tampa because there are so many places in Hillsborough County that, uh, that have characteristics that seem very appealing. So it's worth it to, to, to devote time and trips to go look at possibilities there. OK, yeah? Why don't you factor availability of land into the model? Because, because that's somebody else's job. So, we, so they use a system called land vision. Land vision is, is, a, is a terrific system for looking at individual parcels. And so we give them these, these blue colors as an overlay on land vision. And they say, all right, I'm interested in the Tampa metro area. Show me everything, every land parcel that scores at least 0.8. And they go through each of those. And, and they do what's called you know, pre-qualification. You know, it, it, does it seem possible that we could get this piece of land? Or is it, you know, part of a park? Um, and so they're, they're, there's all this, all these steps of screening, but they're the ones who figure out whether it's big enough. It has to, has to be like nine acres, you know. If it's a one-acre parcel, we can't use it. So I'm not going to do that. They are. Okay. By the way, I was just, um, I was just in the Atlanta area, and I was. Uh, and I was looking at a piece of a, a parcel that they had identified, and it was actually a really good one. And, I, <laughs> and the story is that the owner is a little old lady, and they actually had to jump over her fence to go knock on her door to talk to her about the land. And apparently, it's going to result in a transaction. So, so you know, so the question was, you know, does it is it really as good? Uh, and I looked at this. And, you know, this is this is exactly the kind of thing we want. This is right in our bread bread basket whatever it's called. We, this is our bread and butter. It's right in our wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Sean. Hi. Um, so obviously, once you find the land area that you want to develop in, what other steps do you take afterwards to find that county and to verify the data and make sure that it's all correct and that you want to start developing there? Yeah, so, so that's not, not my part of the job. So I, I learn about it by listening to what other people are saying in the office while I'm working. Um, so yeah, the first, the first is the pre-screening. And there's actually this, this, this really, really well put together uh, workflow from the Land Act team about the steps that they go to to pre-screen, focus more closely just on the ones that meet that first screen. And you know, eventually, it's contact the person. And, and by the way, when you contact the person, 
you know, that can be difficult. But there are ways of doing it, and it can be worth it. So, for example, sometimes it does not say who the owner of that parcel is. It has the, the name of some LLC. That's not going to help you. It's also going to say, though, what is the name of the attorney who filed that paperwork? And if you go to the attorney and say, here's an offer I would like you to pass on to your, to your client, the attorney is legally obligated to do that. So you don't have to know who the client is. You just have to get the offer to them. Okay, so that's what they do. So, so uh, but, you know, there's a, there, after, a, after a parcel um, gets through the pre-screening, so it's at least worth considering at the next step, then there's an initial um, underwriting. And so we're saying, all right, imagine we can build our typical stuff here. Um, imagine it's going to cost what it typically costs. Then how many units would there be? What are the rents we could charge? Therefore, does it seem as though it's going to make money? If it does, then it gets much more careful treatment by the developers and the pre-construction people. They figure out, all right, here's how much it's going to cost to build it because we've got these topological problems to deal with. Okay, so that's, that's a separate, separate part of the company that focuses on pre-construction budgeting. And, um, and so there's, there's this, there's this uh, basic flow chart from different parts of the company, and at the end is finally the IC. But at the IC, you know, it, 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 there needs to be no doubt what the appropriate uh, uh, decisions should be by that time. But, it, you know, it goes back to the underwriters several times, all right? This isn't going to work, but how about this? Or, you know, if we get rid of, uh, you know, if we, if we get rid of this one building, we can put townhouses instead, and that changes the, the numbers in the following way. So they have to re-underwrite it several times. By the way, that's, that's your first job out of, out of school, right? Sit there underwriting deals all day, every day. All right, yeah. Tori. The point eight location score and the one that the oversupply increases. So what's the threshold where it's too high and it's no, no There's no threshold where it's too high. So when I first got to the company, they had certain criteria. You had to meet every one of those criteria. But if you have to meet every one of those criteria separately, then you have to let the criteria be low enough to get you a number of parcels to choose from. So instead, we're saying, all right, it's not as good in this respect, but look how good it is in this respect. So we're coming up with an overall score so that there's no individual criteria. And no, there's, no <coughs> there's no disqualifying factor. And, and those disqualifying factors will show up in the underwriting eventually if they really should disqualify this project. But I'm not disqualifying anything. OK, yeah. Don't qualify for that point eight for certain blocks. In oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Somebody, Somebody comes, comes to us and says, I've got a piece of land. And we look at it and say, it doesn't score point eight. Actually, I was just looking at a piece of land. It scores point seven one or seven four or something like that. Not a big deal. Okay. Another one that I was also looking at yesterday, it scored only like a point five four, but it was across the street from a point nine. I'm not going to care about that. So, so we, so, I, and, I, and I reinforce this all the time in my office. I am not disqualifying any project. I'm also not saying if you look here, you'll be able to find a piece of land. You know, that's somebody else's job. I'm saying it's worth looking. I'm saying it's not worth looking. If something comes in the door, great. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, so nobody has any commentary about whether this is screwed up? I mean, this, this is enough of a, a stark enough difference between these two counties that I am going back and looking at this really, really carefully. And I have not yet found anything that tells me this is wrong. But maybe you can. So you haven't been to the areas Jessica. Huh? You haven't been to the areas of I don't typically go to these places. The only reason I saw these places yesterday was that I was on my way here. And it's hard to get here. So I spent yesterday in Atlanta just to waste time so I could get here. <laughs> Yeah, but the Land Act team, that's what they do. And, and actually, I am encouraged to visit markets. I just usually have better stuff to do. So, yeah. I obviously have a personal investment in this. I think there's some numbers that there's re the drivers behind them aren't clear in the model. So, like, this stabilized vacancy. If you look at the properties in St. Petersburg, I don't know the percentage of properties that are just redevelopment should just be torn down. Mm -hmm. Percentage of properties that are even livable, yeah. I think, would impact the vacancy rate. 
I think the median household income is a result of that existing population. You know, no. I think it might be a five year play for. Median household income is something that they used to put a lot of weight on, and I have been pulling back from that ever since I started this company. Why do people have a low medium ho median household in me in low income? There are two main reasons, right? One is they got a job that doesn't pay much. Two is they're retired. Okay, the first one, all right, we can work with that. The second one, you're going to be looking for an elderly housing community anyway, so why should we bother with you? So the fact that it has a high median median income, that's useful. The fact that it has a low median income, not necessarily a useful piece of information. Um, so, uh, so that's actually one of those pieces of information that I've been trying to champ, tamp down ever since I joined the company. I am so distracted. What is this, South African? English. Is, is it really English? I've been here a while. Okay. <laughs> English slash Florida? Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry, by, sorry for the fact that I was distracted there. <laughs> all right. Um, so listen, I, so that's all I prepared. Um, I want to talk more about what we do, and, I, and I'm happy to go back to any of these slides that we looked at to do that. Um, but, um, but what should we be talking about? What is the most interesting stuff for us to talk about? Yeah. So, so play the devil's advocate a little bit, right? I want to go back to Chattanooga. Uh -huh. I mean, not, 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 not with your, not with your graph, but so to say that I understand the, the idea of kind of um, being more efficient, right? You can't look at every opportunity, right? So if, if in general Chattanooga is not appealing from kind of demand and supply drivers. It, it makes sense to just let's just stay away from it so we don't waste time. Uh, but but what seems what, in, in the end what matters is supply and demand conditions, but price, right? So if someone comes to you with a, a, a parcel of land in Chattanooga oh, that yeah. has a 0.5, but oh, they yeah. report that the seller will sell it at a price that seems to be lower than market value, yeah, so then right. so this this is the question I always Becker knows this I always ask especially professionals, like, well, you say this is not a good market, but at some price, it's a good market. Yeah. So. Yeah, and in fact. I just want to make sure that, that, that there, that's kind of, and you keep saying that's somebody else's job, kind of, and I understand that you're, you're identifying places that have good supply, on a supply and demand perspective, look good. Okay. Right, but at some price, anything can look good. Yeah. At yeah. some price. Yeah, yeah, no, so, you know, look down here in the Miami area. Fabulous locations. Really, really hard to find a piece of land that's available for something like what we do without paying an absolute mint. Now the main reason I don't take land into account is by, because I've been asked explicitly not to. That's it. Set up a scoring system that uses all these pieces of information, not land prices. Now why would that be? One of the main reasons is that land prices are so much for, more volatile than any other, any other factor that we look at. You know, when, when you look at the volatility of real estate in general, and I'm not, not, not talking about the fake volatility that the private equity real estate uh, managers tell you. I'm talking about actual volatility, which is the same as stock volatility. Okay, it is. Okay, so when you look at that volatility, very little of that is the volatility in the value of the property itself. It is mainly volatility in the value of the land. Really hard to measure that. Okay, but that's part of part of what's going on is that land land values are so volatile. He has this grin because he likes the fact that I'm saying. No, no, no. The fake volatility you're referring to refers to relates to some of the comments I made at the advisory board retreat, <laughs> right? The smoothing, right? So I made a presentation at the advisory board retreat. I don't think you've seen this latest paper that we have on catering and return manipulation, but it gets at this issue that <laughs> that that, um, that the vol reported volatility of private equity is low relative to the actual volatility. In my opinion, your opinion, maybe not Bill Hughes's, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, but think to yourself, you know, real estate is an equity asset. Why on earth would it have significantly less volatility than other equity assets? Okay, real estate is just as volatile as stocks. It is, okay, but, um, but that is part of the, part of the, but, but as I said, most of that falls to leaves the land. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> um, it's the residual value. It's the most volatile. Yeah. yeah. All right. What, what else? Yeah. Can you elaborate on why data 
is important? Which items of data are, are important? Like data in general. Yeah, I mean, so look, the, the one thing that's going to make a project underwrite more than anything else is the uh, rents that you can expect. Okay, now, pe a lot of people also look at vacancy rates. That's false. Okay, because a vacancy rate is simply a function of the rent that you're charging. Okay, and so you have to decide, am I going to target rents and allow vacancies to respond, or am I going to target vacancies and allow rents to respond? You know, I, I mentioned before that I pay a lot of attention to mid-Atlantic, mid-America mid apartment communities. Their portfolio-wide vacancy rate does not change. Their rents do. They have made the decision we are going to target this vacancy rate because that's what keeps our units occupied with enough time to get them prepared in between tenants. Okay, if we're if our vacancy rate falls below that, it's because we're not charging high enough rents. If our vacancy rate uh, goes above that, it's because our rents are too high. So let's adjust the rents. So rents are very important. Vacancies are not. Vacancy rates are not. Absorption is kind of a weird one, right? It's saying, all right, to what extent are newly supplied units being filled? They can't be filled unless they're supplied. So it's kind of, it's, it's simply a measure of supply. It's kind of a fake measure. Um, so yeah, we pay attention to absorption too, but I'm never, con never comfortable with even having that variable in, in the model. I'm just, I'm just bothered by it conceptually speaking. But yeah, rents are, are, are the one thing. And then, you know, as Dave was saying, I'm sorry, as Professor Ling was saying, uh, land prices, but we don't, you know, we don't look at that. You know, if you, if you have, if you have a land price and a rent, the other stuff was going to vary, but it's not going to vary enough to, to, to make it a go or a stop decision. Um, you know, except in certain places like uh, Asheville, North Carolina, really hard to build there. Okay, it doesn't matter if you have a pe cheap piece of land, it's going to be really hard to build, build and really costly to build. So you have to take that, in, that stuff into account. I don't have to, the Land Act people do. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. Um, a question that I, I'm interested in, I think a lot of people are probably interested in, in, in terms of the affordable housing crisis, I think that's going to be a problem for a lot of this generation, <laughs> firstly, like I, I'd like to own a house one day, and um, rents and housing prices are out, outpaced income, you know, exponentially over the past few years. Is that something you're considering when you're doing development in terms of, I know other countries are doing like macroeconomic policies to kind of stamp that out? Or do you think the free market can kind of I, solve that? I'm saying I think a lot of governments would like to be thought of as the kind of people who are doing policies to address that problem. They're not, generally speaking. But do you think that's a risk in terms of developments here? No, no, that's our opportunity. So, so what's going on? There are a couple of things going on. Um, one is, especially since the pandemic, but this has been going on for decades, people are moving from some parts of the U.S. to other parts of the U.S. Why are we in the Southeast? Because that's where they're moving to. Um, so that increases demand. It also makes a, a housing affordability issue in a part of the country that never used to have one. Um, second, um, there, the headship rate. The headship rate is the number of um, households divided by the number of adults. And the headship rate was jacked up artificially before the, the great financial crisis by federal government housing policy. It plummeted as a result of that housing crisis. It started to recover, then the pandemic hit, it plummeted again. Now it's really started to recover. That means more rental housing units are in demand relative to the adult population. So put those two together, the migration to our part of the country and the increase in the headship rate, um, those, that's, that's where, uh, that's number one, where a housing affordability crisis comes from. And I think crisis is not the right word, but I'll go with it. Um, and number two, it's what makes it, it's what gets us paid for what we do. We are trying as hard as we can to solve that problem as fast as we can. It's just really hard to do. So do you think the free market will solve that or the government will have to step in, for example, to pass the policy on rent? Uh, no. So, 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 so the typical government response, this is, and this is a much broader issue than just um, than just you know rent control. Um, the typical government response is one which is seen to be a response rather than a response. Yeah, if you want to reduce housing costs, the only way you can do it 
is to make it easier to build housing. And so now two thirds of the com country, country are owners. Only one third in the rentership rate gotcha. is only, it's about 35%, okay? So two thirds of the people would rather see a housing affordability crisis because it means their main asset is worth more. Okay, that's the basic problem. So how do you address a problem like that? Well, for example, friends of mine um, in Washington, D.C. have been in a rent, rent control apartment for about 25 years. They are wealthy, but rent control does not depend on whether they're wealthy or not. It depends on whether they're in a, in a rent control apartment. That's like the stupidest thing I can imagine. So uh, yes, to the extent that there is government policy to address housing affordability issues, it is typically government policy that will exacerbate housing affordability issues. That's the basic problem. Now, um, one of the things that we're, that this is not a motivation. As we develop our single family rental housing communities, what we're trying to say is there is an alternative. If you want four walls, you don't have to buy a house. You can rent something. Okay, and it's going to be nicer, and it's going to be enable you to go and take that job in Tallahassee, uh, in, instead of being being stuck in your house in in Gainesville. Sorry, um, uh, and my hope is that as that um, part of the rental housing market, which never existed before, becomes successful, people will say, "All right, this makes sense. What I want is not." to own a house, but to have four walls. So here's how I can do that. So, so yes, the market will solve that problem. It will not solve it quickly, and it will never solve it to universal um, uh, agreement. Yeah. Um, so I know there's a little bit of discussion going on right now, um, forecasting what's gonna happen with uh, the historic expected wealth transfer between the baby boomers and the younger generation. Um, when I kind of think about this in my, in my head, I think about a lot of younger people who have never had the opportunity to buy homes coming into a ton of money, like $60 trillion or something in the next decade or so, um, potentially having that opportunity. Is that, are, those, are there conversations about what's going to happen to the rental space um, in, within that time frame, or is it just too far down the horizon? It's, I think it's too, it's too esoteric. I, I don't know of anybody who has been thinking about it very carefully. Um, but you know, here's the problem. So I've, I've got a mother who's 93 or whatever, um, and my parents... <laughs> An approximation spot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my parents were financially very successful, um, and they built up a lot of equity in their house, um, which is really a nice house. Um, and they lived a lot longer than they expected. My dad finally died at 102. I'm like, Dad, come on. Um, all right, joke, joke. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, year, a year ago plus two days. Um, anyway, so what did they do? They spent the money that they had built up that they intended to leave to their kids. So we're down to where um, the cash available to pay my mother's bills will run out um, in the middle of next year, if not possibly earlier, depending on tuition needs for my nieces. So what if we've got an entire generation of people who have built up that kind of wealth and they're going to spend it uh, before they actually transfer it? I, my wife and I have been trying to transfer wealth as quickly as we possibly can to our children, not, not waiting until we die. That's not going to be useful to them at that time. When your parents die, not going to be useful to you either. You will have already bought your house if you're going to buy one. You will have already paid, paid tuition for your kids. Okay? So uh, this, is the, this idea that suddenly, suddenly the people who need more money to do things like buy a house are going to have it, I don't see it happening. This is, this is very off topic. This is very off topic. And so keep this in mind. Okay? Each of your parents can give you up to $16,000 a year without triggering tax consequences. Get them to do that. 